So far we have only worked with the standard normal distribution which has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And the variable we use to represent values in this distribution is z. But there are many other types of normal distributions that are not standard. That is, the mean is not 0 or the standard deviation is not 1 or, most of the time, both. For these normal distributions we usually use the variable x to represent the values. Remember still that the area under a normal curve represents a probability. So here's an example of finding probabilities for normal distributions. Maximum capacities for elevators are determined by the maximum weight that the elevator can hold, and the maximum number of passengers is determined by assumptions about average weights. Suppose the maximum capacity for an elevator is found to be 3,500 pounds and the maximum number of passengers is given as 25. This assumes that the mean weight of the passengers is 140 pounds. Assume the worst case that all passengers are men, since men have a greater mean weight. Assume also that the weights of the men are normally distributed with a mean of 191 pounds and a standard deviation of 30 pounds. So if one man is randomly selected, what is the probability he weighs less than 140 pounds? So we want the probability that the weight x is less than 140. In probability notation, this would be probability x less than 140. Again, we're going to draw the picture of our distribution. And when you do this, it's a really good idea to label the mean, and then at least one standard deviation below and above the mean, just so you get a general idea of what the distribution looks like. So 191 was our mean, and if we go one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above that, we've got 161 and 221. Now our 140 is a little bit below 161. So we want the probability that x is less than 140, which means that we're going from 140 to the left. Again, we can look at which direction this inequality points to tell us which direction to shade. So again, we don't have a bound on the left end, so we're going to use a large negative number like 100,000 for our lower bound. We'll use 140 for our upper bound. And this time we're putting in 191 for the mean and 30 for the standard deviation. So if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of approximately 0.0446. Now this probability is less than 0 0.05, so we would actually consider this to be an unusual event. Here's another example. If we look at IQ scores, they're also normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So first of all, we can figure out what percentage of the population has IQ scores at or below 90. So first we're going to draw our picture, and again I'm labeling the mean and one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above. You can label more than this, but for sure you need to have at least these three values labeled. Then the value we're interested in is 90, and because we're going from 90 down, that means we're going to shade from there to the left. And if we want to write this in probability notation, this would be the probability that x is less than or equal to 90. Again, the inequality is pointing to the left, just like our shading is going to the left. To put this in your calculator, again we'd use a large negative number for our lower bound, we'd use 90 for our upper bound, and our mean was 100, our standard deviation was 15. On your calculator this should come out to be 
about 2.2525. That means that about 25% of the population has IQ scores at or below 90. If you remember when we talked about percentiles back in Chapter 3, this could also be interpreted as the 25th percentile for IQ scores because about 25% of the population has a score of 90 or lower. So part B of this problem says what is the probability that a randomly selected person has an IQ score above 90? Now this time we're going to use the complement to figure this out. Since we just found the probability that x is less than or equal to 90, x greater than, or greater than 90 is the complement of that. So all we would have to do is subtract our previous answer from 1. Our previous answer was 0.2525, so if we subtract that from 1, we get 0.7475. Part C asks, what is the probability that a randomly selected person has an IQ score between 85 and 115? So here's our picture with our three values labeled, and it just so happens that 85 is exactly one standard deviation below the mean, and 115 is one standard deviation above the mean. So here's our area shaded in between those two. So for this, we can just use 85 as our lower bound and 115 as our upper bound on our calculator. And we put in the 100 for the mean and the 15 for the standard deviation. And this gives us an answer of 0.6827. If this seems somewhat familiar, that's good. When we talked about the empirical rule back in Chapter 3, remember that said that approximately 68% of values are between are within one standard deviation of the mean and that was when we had a bell-shaped curve. So that ties directly to what we have here. We've got exactly one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean and the area under our curve is the same as the percentage of data values that would be between those two values. And what this means is that if we're given the area under the curve or the probability, then we can work backwards to find the value of the variable. In order to do this, we have to know the mean and the standard deviation of the normal distribution. And on your calculator, the function inverse norm, which takes the probability, the mean, and the standard deviation, finds this value of x for us. The function assumes that the area under the curve is to the left of the x value. Going back to the elevator example, we're assuming that the weights of men are normally distributed with a mean of 191 pounds and a standard deviation of 30 pounds. What weight separates the lightest 10% of men from the heaviest 90%? This is another way of asking for a cutoff value. We're looking for the boundary value that separates the lowest 10% from the highest 90%. If you think about that in terms of where the values are, this means that we're looking for the area to the left of the value to be the 10%. So if we draw our picture, and again I put in the mean and one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above, We can make an educated guess about where that cutoff value might be. And it's not that important that you're, that you're totally accurate on these as long as you realize that 10% is going to be less than half of the graph and as long as you're shading in the right direction. That's the important thing. So again, I just made a guess about where this value might be, shaded it to the left, so this area in here is our 10%. The area over here would be the 90%, but we can't use that if we're using that function on our calculator because it will calculate from our cutoff value to the left. 
So we're going to use inverse norm, 0 0.10, 191, 30, to get our cutoff value, which turns out to be 152.6. So the value right here is 152.6 pounds. So that would be the cutoff for determining the lightest 10% of men. So in other words, men who weigh less than this would be in the bottom 10%. Men who weigh more than this would be in the top 90% as far as weights. We could also interpret this as the 10th percentile for men's weights.